My name is Steve Macias, and this is why I left the ACNA. But before I begin, uh, I need to preface by saying that this title is a little bit sensationalistic and a little bit misleading, uh, because I currently am a presbyter uh, in good standing in the Diocese of Mid-America in uh, the Reformed Episcopal Church, which is a jurisdiction of the Anglican Church in North America. But uh, before I got there, uh, I was actually confirmed in the ACNA under a different diocese. Uh, I came into the ACNA under the Churches for the Sake of Others. I was confirmed by Bishop Todd Hunter, and I served for a number of years uh, in his churches in Northern California. And eventually, though, I did leave the ACNA and then come back to the ACNA. And uh, it's not appropriate to go through um, all of the details and about who was involved and why I left and different things uh, at a granular level, but I think it is important for me to describe what I think is a common uh, viewpoint that young men like me experience uh, when we're dissatisfied with our kind of ecclesiastical politics. And I have to like admit, and I've had to repent of really a, a an arrogance that I had that was not really based on a certain degree of intelligence or uh, capability or leadership qualities or even theological acumen, but really based on some misconceptions about what the church is and the role of the institutional church. And the reason I'm making this video today and why I think it's appropriate to talk about this is because of what's happening in the Church of England uh, with its institutional identity. Uh, so Church of England is going through something very similar to what uh, the Episcopal Church, which is uh, kind of the cognate of that in the America. So the short history is when Anglicanism came with the founding fathers to America, it became the uh, you know, Episcopal Church, originally the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States. And this is the church that George Washington belonged to before the revolution and after the revolution. And many of our American presidents and lots of our cultural history as Protestants in America uh, come from the Episcopal Church that really went through a, a crisis first over revisions of its own prayer book, over women's ordination, doctrines around the uh, inerrancy of the scripture, or even uh, specific uh, you know, creedal ideas like the virgin birth or the resurrection, uh, ultimately leading up to uh, discussions about homosexuality and the role of openly homosexual bishops, which caused the creation of an alternative to the Episcopal Church in the Anglican Church in North America, Anglican Church in North America, or ACNA, um, as a jurisdiction for people who wanted to remain Anglican but could not submit to unorthodox or even perhaps not even legitimate bishops because of their moral uh, identities. Uh, so a similar thing has now happened in the Church of England, where the blessing of same sex couples, or however you want to choose to nuance it, the idea is the acceptance of homosexuality in an ecclesiastical body, which for uh, conservative Christians who believe that the tradition of the church from the apostolic period until now has taught consistently that marriage is uh, ordained by God, an institution, uh, the church may bless but not change. It's one man and one woman. And so this is creating uh, factions within the Church of England. There's already uh, a existing alternative to the Church of England. Uh, well, there's actually a number, but you know the Free Church of England is one of them uh, that have kind of an Anglican identity, but there's also the, the Anglican mission in Europe and uh, bishops there as well. But this causes concern uh, for people who are either in the ministry or are considering churches because this sense of institutional divide, you know, all of these Protestant denominations as we see them grow and divide, uh, stands in contrast to what we imagine Jesus is saying uh, in the Gospels about the church being one. And so as a young Christian, recently confirmed a part of the Anglican Church, one of the appeals or the draws to the liturgical tradition was a, a continuity with the bishop, tracing it back to a apostolic lineage, either by baptism or by ordination. Uh, but there was a connection between what we believe today 
and what the early church believed, and that there was some type of organic or institutional unity amongst them. And when we see the church divided over these issues, we perhaps doubt the validity of a particular polity or ecclesiastical system. And that's the conversation that I've had over the last few weeks with some folks who are struggling um, with these divides in the church. And last night I even had a conversation with a young man who uh, was struggling with whether or not he should be Eastern Orthodox or remain Anglican because of the issue of institutional uh, unity. And we can talk about all of the different definitions of what makes a church, but in my mind as a young person, institutional unity had often been one church under one denomination, kind of like what we see uh, under maybe perhaps the Roman Catholic Church where everybody submits to the Pope. And I had a type of, of naivety that thought that that is what unity was and that that's what Protestants should strive for. That Protestant unity would be all under one organization with a uh, monolithic set of beliefs. And I think lots of denominations fall into that trap. Uh, we've seen uh, in my church history, folks of the Reformed side who said, if we're not following Westminster, you're not really Reformed, you're not part of the institutional church. And so you've seen splinters there. Uh, but on this question, we have to ask, is institutional unity, the mark of a church being one. Uh, now, I think Protestants can or must admit that it can't be that, right? Because there's a reason uh, that the Protestant church divides from uh, the church Catholic, whether you say we are divorced from them or they divorce from us. Or however you want to frame it, you have to recognize that the Protestant reformers saw there were two different Christian bodies, and that it was worthy as a Protestant to see that division. Uh, so sometimes concessions are made in that direction, and uh, I've had Anglican friends lament that. I've had Anglican friends celebrate that. But I think it goes back even further than that. I think a lot of us are putting our hope in polity as though it is the solution for this institutional unity problem as though uh, an Episcopal system or a Presbytery system, a Presbyterian system, or a Congregational system somehow might be the panacea that would solve our problems. But the sad truth is, every single government system has succumbed to some degree of liberalism or humanism. So um, perhaps my friends in the PCA or some other conservative reform denomination might point to what's happening and say, see, that's the problem when you let bishops be in charge or when you involve the state in your religion, uh, you should try Presbyterianism. But, you know, the largest, the larger Presbyterian denominations, for example, uh, the PCUSA, where I had my first ministry job, uh, is probably the most humanist of all of the American denominations outside of perhaps universalism or, or Unitarianism. Um, so the idea of Presbyterianism somehow wasn't a bulwark itself. There had to be something else in addition to that. Uh, and the same thing can be seen with Congregationalism. There are very staunch, reformed, conservative Congregationalists in history, men like, uh, say, Jonathan Edwards. But <laughs> today, Congregationalism is a grab bag. It can be anything. The, the system of poly doesn't guarantee, uh, doesn't guarantee orthodoxy. And... While that was frustrating for me as uh, a young Anglican, by studying church history, you recognize it's not really a new issue for the church. Uh, my oldest son's name is Athanasius, and I'd read uh, you know, his work on the Incarnation. I had read uh, his biography of St. Anthony. I'd read different biographies. Other people had written about Athanasius, and yet still I didn't recognize the type of, of ecclesiastical chaos that the world was in during his life. Right? The fact that he lived in an, a, a system that had other bishops, and yet he had not, as we often imagine, this ideal sense of institutional unity where all the church was one. The church was still in this unity institutionally, even though it survived. And so you have to ask the question, what allowed uh, the apostolic church, the patristic church, uh, even you know the, this 
church that lived through the Great Schism, the church that lived through the medieval period, the church that lived through the Reformation, what allows it to continue? And ultimately the answer is, of course, that the Holy Spirit doesn't leave the church and that promises of Christ that the church will not fail belong to the church. But it's never in the history of church an emphasis on the institutional unity, meaning the strength of the church of Athanasius was not that one group of people suddenly took charge, set everything correct, and from the top down, everything worked out. It was always a, a call back to a higher standard beyond the polity. Now, I say that as somebody who certainly, as an Anglican, believe that bishops are the biblical form of our government. I believe they're, they're a historic form of government. I believe that the bishops are the right form, and I am uh, wholeheartedly in favor in that. But I trust my bishops because they trust the scripture. I trust my bishops in our tradition because I know their ultimate authority is the scripture. And that also is a sense in which the institutional unity must be secondary to a, a unity of belief. And there's not really a, a, another way to describe this other than you know, creedal orthodoxy or, or mere Christianity, that those are the things that must hold us together, not uh, a false belief that to be in communion with Canterbury or to be in communion with some historic see, those things are not what saves the church. What saves the church is its faith and reliance on the doctrines that the scripture give us, or, or the scripture itself that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us. Uh, so to tell my story, uh, a little bit about why I left the ACNA, uh, really was me becoming frustrated with the portion of the, the ACNA that I was in. And one of the issues that really was a struggle for me was that my diocese had uh, women in orders. And so what that, what that means is they allowed females to be ordained um, as deacons, and the diocese allowed females to be ordained as priests. And somebody who was more uh, Catholic-minded, myself, uh, Catholic-minded meaning not in the sense of the ritual or uh, Roman Catholicism, but somebody who said that we have to continue to believe what was believed at all times, everywhere, uh, the rule of, of St. Vincent type of, of thinking. And for me, it was not a degradation of women or holding to some antiquated view of women, but rather that because the church had never ordained women in the role of presbyter or a liturgical function for women in the celebration of Holy Communion, in the history of the church, as you can see with the uh, continuation of a male-only priesthood in both the, the Roman and Orthodox churches and in the Anglican church up until the 1960s, right? So there is this historical record that women were not priests, were not deacons, and yet here I was struggling with an institutional identity where I knew this particular belief didn't jive with the rest. And I, there are some parts where it's an issue and some parts where it's not an issue. I think if you don't have a female minister in your congregation, maybe you don't deal with it. And I think there are lots of folks in the Anglican communion who don't have a female minister, it doesn't bother them. Or they grew up after a time when it was normal to have female ministers and so they don't recognize it as a discontinuity with history. Or they have been falsely taught that there were historically women in ministry and that somehow patriarchy of Christendom had snuffed them out, which is also not true. Or they have been taught that somehow the Bible has changed its meaning and um, now we can have female uh, ministers. But uh, for me, it wasn't an issue serving in the ACNA because my particular portion of the diocese didn't have a female priest to serve over me. So I didn't have to come up to receive communion from a woman. I didn't have to support that kind of ministry until I did. And uh, so as somebody who was pursuing holy orders, I decided uh, that this was an issue that put the ACNA at odds with the rest of historic Christendom. And so I left the ACNA. And I think there are a lot of people like me who feel feel that way, that this is like a symptom of under other underlying issues. That if you can't be reliable on the issue of female orders, 
then what else are you willing to compromise on when this is something really, really crystal clear, both biblically in the writings of St. Paul, historically in the history of the church, and theologically because of what a male minister in the uh, celebration of Holy Communion means. And so if you're willing to compromise on something like that, that destroys your institutional unity with historic Christendom, meaning now there is no longer any connection between Anglican bodies that ordain women and historic Christian groups like Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox. They can't even uh, recognize each other's orders because they're completely different substantive things to have male and female elders or male and female presbyters. Uh, so I left the ACNA and I spent some time in what we call today as the Anglican uh, continuum. And uh, there are a number of fractured groups here, but what was characteristic of the Anglican continuum was really this emphasis on doctrinal purity in various forms. So some people in the continuum are very doctrinally conform, conformed to a sense of Anglo-Catholicism in the use of the Missal or the use of a, of a ritual system. Uh, and that's kind of more of the, the side that I would gravitate towards. Um, but then there were others that were very uh, low church or focused more on a sense of, of soteriological unity and the ritual and the dress was less important to them. And uh, for the most part, though, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle there. I would describe myself as, as reformed theologically. I have a history in reformed and Presbyterian churches, and so that kind of theology is uh, really important to me, but I don't object to the wearing of surplices or cassocks or uh, different use of candles or incense. And so uh, in the continuum, I really didn't fit in in either world. But there was also that same issue of institutional unity. Here I was leaving the ACNA because it didn't jive with my definition of institutional church as being one into a more fractured body. And those of us in the continuum recognize this. We, we, we recognize the kind of, I don't know, the cognitive dissonance or, or the, the self-perpetuating narrative that uh, the, this church over here is so divided, so let's divide again, how that, that was counterproductive. And so men in the continuum either committed to uh, a resolve of, oh well, we're just going to hold on to this legacy, keep these museum churches alive for the sake of the doctrine, um, or what I saw a lot of uh, young men struggling with this path do, they would go into a church that purported or described itself as being more institutionally one. And usually that was Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. And for me, though, that was just a jump too far. Theologically, uh, as an Anglican, I am a Protestant. And it's not because I object to uh, an icon or a crucifix, although you know, arguments can be made about those things, but it's primarily an issue of salvation by grace, by faith. Those are the dividing lines between what makes somebody <laughs> Protestant or Catholic, right? Those are the issues debate, debated at the Council of Trent. Whether or not you should wear a surplus, those are intramural fights amongst Protestants um, and uh, weren't really my main concern. But as these men went off into Catholicism or Orthodoxy, I've seen many return because what they see in Roman Catholicism is that the institutional unity is not uh, a uniformity or a comfort. There, there are sacrifices they have to make there as well. You know, a conservative man who's tratting out, uh, becoming more conservative Roman Catholic, goes over the Tiber and joins a conservative diocese, still belongs to a church where Francis is his pope and uh, the German bishops are still in communion with him and has this strange bedfellow relationship with uh, liberals or neoliberals or folks. And so you have to kind of pick which be uh, poisonous bedfellows you want your community to be a part of. And the same thing is true uh, in those who choose to go the route of Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, my reason for staying Anglican and not being Roman Catholic or not being Eastern Orthodox is theologically, not political. It's I am a person who believes uh, in the scripture as they're taught by the 39 Articles of Religion. But the men who would go off into Orthodoxy 
perhaps they can overlook those theological differences. But the, the promise of institutional unity is not there. The, the division between uh, the, the Antiochians and the Greeks and the Russians are real. And it's not just ethnic differences. There are real theological differences between uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox theologians, and they have maybe not the same dividing lines as us of you know, abortion or female ordination, but they do have differences politically and uh, ecclesiastically, and they are not institutionally united and perfect and unchanged uh, since the time of the apostles. Every denomination that you look at as institutionally one does have its divisions, its bumps, its sores, its bruises. Um, and here, uh, when I was in the continuum, I went through a couple of these uh, divisions and changes where bishops move and, and uh, one of our bishops wanted to become Orthodox and it wasn't uh, a bridge I could cross over and my congregation certainly would not have gone that way. And the uh, choice I had to make was to find a place where I could fit in. And so strangely enough, I found myself back into the ACNA. I don't think I would have gone back into the same diocese that I was confirmed in. Um, and for a number of reasons, I don't think my congregation would have gone back into the same diocese I was confirmed in. Uh, but what I did um, is when I was doing research about what we should do, because we're not going to be Orthodox and we're not going to be, I'm not going to be an independent Anglican, it's kind of an oxymoron, uh, I ran into an old friend. And uh, I say ran into, meaning he, I sent him an email, he called me. And uh, that old friend is, is Ray Sutton. And uh, I should call him Bishop Sutton because he is my <laughs> Bishop Ordinary. He's presiding Bishop of the RAC. And I just sent him an email saying, this is what our church is going through. Here are what I, here's what I feel about the ACNA. Here are my concerns. And what should I do? And I was deferring to somebody with, with wisdom. I, I first uh, encountered Ray Sutton years ago through his old Tyler work, uh, which uh, is great. And I was convinced of the idea of episcopacy through a pamphlet he wrote a number of years ago. Um, and then I was a, a delegate to one of the ACNA uh, assemblies. Uh, I can't remember which year that was, you know, almost, almost 10 years ago. Uh, and that's when I first met him in person. And then uh, when I, I reached out and said, hey, one of our bishops is going orthodox, kind of orthodox, uh, not traditional orthodox, uh, and I'm not going to go with them. You know, what, what should we do? Because you know, I've had issues in the ACNA, and I don't really have faith in this whole women's orders issue. And um, that's when he, he really captured me with uh, the vision of the REC. Now, I knew what the REC was. I had copies of the REC prayer book for you know, the last 15 years. Ever since becoming an Anglican, the REC has been something I knew about, um, but I didn't quite understand the dynamics of how the RAC was formed, uh, the purpose of it from this you know, last century and a half of its history, and its role in the ACNA. And so often you'll hear the RAC described as a, a founding jurisdiction of the Anglican Church in North America, uh, which, is, which is accurate. When uh, the Episcopal Church was really going through this crisis over the ordination of a, a gay bishop, uh, the RAC already had existed, you know, for over a century as a, a, a Anglican denomination, and it already had an existence and a pedigree of being faithful to the Anglican formularies, to the Book of Common Prayer, to the Articles, and had maintained its, its Episcopal lineage, you know, all the way back through. And so uh, this witness provided a, a good partner for a group like the ACNA, where all of these other diocese were coming out of the Episcopal Church and forming an alternative body with the help of the, um, you know, the GAFCON or the Global Anglican, uh, Global Anglican Movement with the, you know, the Africans and the South Americans and the, the other conservative Anglican bodies that didn't want to recognize the Episcopal Church because of their moves not only from orthodoxy but from biblical sexual ethics and identity. Uh, and so I'm talking with with Bishop Sutton on the telephone and explaining uh, my young man's view of, 
well, doesn't the church need to have a, a unified view on this, this, and this? And he, he, I can't remember the exact quotes, and so I'm not going to pretend that I could quote that conversation that we had over the phone one day after one of the school days here at Canterbury. But the gist of the conversation was that the REC is insulated. And uh, that, that's an interesting thing to say, but the REC as a jurisdiction uh, is, in itself, its own jurisdiction within the ACNA. And so it has its own uh, you know, government, its own house, its own con you know, convention-type materials. And so the REC continued to exist as its own church. And then covenants together with the larger conservative Anglican Church in North America. Now, that's probably unusual. I don't know my uh, ecclesiastical allegiance history in the Reformation to know if there's any other groups that have done something exactly like this. Uh, but what it meant for me is that the issue of women's orders, uh, the issue of you know, liberalism or humanism or all of the other theological controversies that have corrupted the other churches were fenced away from the REC, that the REC's bishops had created a place where in our diocese, uh, you know, whether it was here on the West Coast or in uh, Texas or there in the Northeast or the Southeast, that these REC bodies uh, would be governing themselves according to their established principles, and they couldn't be changed by this new institution uh, called the ACNA, should the the cancer of women's ordinations continued to spread, right? So they had safeguarded a place for people like me, uh, who were theologically conservative, biblical-minded, reformed, liturgical Christians to serve. Um, and I think that's uh, that was a, a big relief for me at the time, but it also came with not just a bunker-down mentality, uh, because it also, and Bishop Sutton also invited me to be a part of uh, a vision of God's victory in working out in North American Anglicanism, right? Rather than continuing to break down and splinter and continue to uh, separate ourselves from any place of influence, the REC is right here in the middle of the ACNA. And I think there's a confidence that the REC bishops have that I didn't have as a you know 20-something year old uh, seminarian or aspirant or postulant, and that was that God was going to work out for his good, his church. And so when the bishops tell you, uh, you know, God's at work in his church and he's going to work all these things out, we don't have to worry about winning every single battle all across the world. We're going to be faithful with what God has given us, and we'll see the blessing in return for that. Uh, that kind of changed me from finding the pure institutional church to finding a faithful church with a vision that it will win in the future. And so I can't pretend to know the future of what the ACNA will do or what various dioceses will do. But since I joined a number of years ago, uh, I have not seen in a creeping towards liberalism. I've seen the exact opposite. By the REC being a witness to the churches in the ACNA. They've been able to hold the line on a number of issues that we really care about, right? There's not been a, a, an effusion of women forced it upon us as uh, was feared by some in the very beginning, no. People have respected our boundaries and our pulpits and our communion tables, and we've been able to keep our tradition as it, as it is expected by our constitutions and canons. But on the other side of that, the RSC has grown as a consequence of that. We've been able to, uh, develop uh, new <laughs> new ways of influencing North American Anglicanism uh, by being involved in the conversation, by being involved in the national and also international conversation. The RSC has been given a very important role to represent the tradition as a substantial body. Uh, but I don't speak for the RSC, um, so I'm just a lowly presbyter who is grateful for a place to serve in the church. And so don't conflate anything that I say as the official position of the RSC. Um, and I know our, our diocesan office uh, loves to field questions about this. And uh, they're very gifted at the relationships both between Anglicans and uh, other ecumenical bodies. In fact, 
Uh, Bishop Sutton is the ecumenical officer between the ACNA and other Christian bodies. But all of that to say something that I tell people who visit our local church all of the time, and that there's, there's no perfect church. I, I, as a pastor, will probably let you down or fail you. You'll probably disagree with me about something. Uh, but I believe that God put you here to serve in this church for a reason. You came in off the street to serve in this ministry. And even though all of us aren't going to be institutionally identical, that God does work out in his body, uh, that union, Jesus says, of us being one through the messy human relationships we do have. And the proper perspective, I believe, that, that we as Reformed Anglicans should have is not to continue to retreat and bunker down and divide and be divisive and tear down other bishops, but rather put forward what we have to offer. You know, continue to preach those sermons, continue to teach, continue to raise up new seminarians, new priests, new pastors, new ministries, new churches. And it is that movement forward that is going to create the unity that you so desire. Um, the other way of, of tearing down everybody who is in slight disagreement with you is not going to be a path towards growth. Now, before I was um, in the Anglican Church, I had a job in the State Assembly. I worked in California for the Republican in a pretty conservative district, but in the state level, we were a very, very ineffectual office because we didn't really have the votes. We were a small minority in a largely Democrat state. And I had a mentor at the time who gave me a vision uh, for how to handle it when maybe you're in the minority, yet you need to exert influence or even protect or preserve your influence in that situation. And uh, he used the uh, an illustration from a book by a man named H.L. Richardson, who was a California state senator a number of years ago who is now passed, but H.L. Richardson talked about this, this whole spectrum of participation in the political cycle. He said, if you imagine a, a spectrum of all the people who are uh, eligible to vote in a particular district. So you have the total population, but only a small portion of those people actually register to vote. And then of those who actually register to vote, an even smaller portion of those people actually show up <laughs> to cast their vote. And so even though there might be millions of people or tens of thousands of people in any particular uh, government you know, a designated area for a assembly or for a senate or a congressional seat, the actual number of people who participate is much smaller. And then of those people who actually cut, cast their votes, only a small number of them do anything beyond vote for the person whose name they recognize. Uh, one of the things we learned in political campaigns is name ID was the number one reason somebody voted for you. They saw your yard sign, they saw the sign on the highway, they saw your TV commercial, they heard your radio ad. Even if they do nothing about your issue, they saw the right letter, Republican or Democrat next to your name, and they recognized the name, then you probably got their vote. So of those people who are actively engaged in this political process, a very small number are actually influencing it. But it gets even more granular than that because only a small percentage of people in any particular district are involved in perhaps the central committee where they choose the candidates or in the uh, committee for fundraising or for any particular candidate. The, the activist number of people who choose the policies, choose the candidates, all that is this minuscule number. And I can testify that who the assemblyman might be in a, any given California district was determined by maybe three or four dozen central committee members who debated amongst themselves and they would choose that person who would go on the ballot and they would choose you know, how to influence that. So power, even though it had been delegated over a great number of people, the influence came from just a few dedicated folks in the minority. And so Often we get lost in this idea of institutional unity that says, if we can get everybody under one authority, <laughs> then all of our problems will be solved. But yet the church is never focused, or never won when it focused that way. Athanasius was won against all of the other bishops, deposed uh, more than once, right? And so it was the 
dedicated minority that believed in something that was real, that had the real influence. And so that illustration for me was perhaps a small Anglican remnant who believes in the articles and formularies is the same functioning body as this in the political sphere. Uh, the other anecdote that I'll, I'll close with here um, is something that another pastor told to me. And I, I used to write these uh, blogs that were critical of other people in my reformed camp. So, you know, I, I disagreed with somebody's view on a book, and so I wrote a blog about it and criticized this person and impugned their character and made all conclusions. And I, even though I'd never met the guy, right? But because he believed X, Y, and Z, he must be a scoundrel and believe all these things as well. And so a very wise and, and loving pastor pulled me aside. He didn't say, take down those blogs. What he said uh, was very similar to what I just said about the power of influence from a small number of people, but the opposite direction. And uh, he said, Steve, how many, how many Christians are there in America today? And I said, oh, probably about maybe half or less. This is a number of years ago of America Christians. And he says, right, Steve. So you got half of America are Christians. And how many of those Christians do you think believe the Bible is God's word? <laughs> and, and he got a little bit smaller. And he said, and, and how many of those Christians do you think are reformed? You know, they, they, they hold to the doctrines of grace. Oh, that's a, that's a much smaller number. You know, the elect are small. And then of those reformed, how many and we went through a couple of issues, you know, like how many believe in infant baptism and, and how many believe in, I think the issue he asked was post-millennialism, right? And so we get down to, we could fit all of these people in one NFL stadium, right? <laughs> uh, we could probably fit all these people in one high school gymnasium at some on some of these issues. But he looked at me and he said, so Steve, you, you, you see the people in this room, why are you fighting those guys? the people who agree with you on all of these other issues instead of the people who don't, uh, instead of the people who aren't Christians, instead of the people who don't understand the gift of free salvation. Why are you fighting the folks in your own camp? And I think that is also one of our, our great enemies as Anglicans because we take so much pride, uh, and that's an appropriate word, in our own systems, our formularies, our own confessions, our own history, our own bishops, our own understanding of it, uh, that we fire on the people who should be our allies. Not to say that the woman who puts on a collar has to be your ally, but every bishop who doesn't agree with you on everything you line up as important isn't your enemy. And uh, that's a difficult thing for a young 20-something-year-old man to admit, and it requires a little bit of humility. It requires somebody to trust that, that perhaps, and I, I believe this is the case, but perhaps through the realignment process, God creating the ACNA, using the RSC as part of that, through the Church of Nigeria's work in helping restart Anglicanism in North America, that there's going to be... Uh, a, a real biblical Anglicanism that emerges from here. But it's not going to happen all at once like magic. It's going to require a, a patient humility where you hold to your convictions but recognize that people have to be brought along just like you were brought along. We can't hate people <laughs> for holding positions that we might have held just a few years ago. But we need to patiently teach diligently give a reason for why we believe without destroying this fragile house that is Anglicanism today. And I think, uh, perhaps you're not an Anglican watching this, but it's, I think it's also true if you're in the PCA, uh, where you're trying to preserve the gospel there against uh, you know, revoice for other, other things like that, or if you're in this conservative Methodist movement that's happening, or perhaps you're in the Southern Baptist Convention. These are all similar fights that we're fighting, but we can be united on the idea that Scripture is our authority, Christ is our Lord, uh, salvation is by free grace, and rather than recognizing that the great issue is uh, some Anglican not getting the formularies right in our own, in our own place, that the real issue is Christendom as a movement 
Christendom as a, a part of history is now at a point where we need to defend the basics of the faith. And then we're, when we're arguing about these fringe issues and tearing down each other here at the, at the edges on these, not even secondary, not even third level, but really lower level issues, we're not just destroying uh, our witness before the world, but this institutional unity that we all claim we want is being even more eroded because there will be no Christendom if we destroy it from within. And uh, I think that there is a, a greater battle from without, right? The, the, the world around us is, is quickly moving away from Christianity, and we're not going to address that issue by these, this infighting on the inside. So basically that's why I left the ACNA. I thought I needed to find a more perfect church. I had to face that there really wasn't a perfect church. And I came back into a wonderful church, the, the REC, with, with fantastic bishops who um, never in my life if I had bishops call me so regularly to just check it up on us. I never in my life if I felt so supported by a brotherhood of priests. Never in my life have I felt uh, the freedom to experiment and try things in the church. Never have I ever experienced uh, really the, the lively growth and uh, this joy of ministry that I see amongst the men uh, in our diocese and, and around the RSC, around the country. And I think that's true in a lot of ACNA diocese, that we move past this idea that we're not the Episcopal Church, we move past the idea that we're fighting over these issues and have gone to the other side and said, our battle for today is to preserve Christendom for our children and for the next thousand years. And to do that, I'm going to have to make some alliances that require some humility within me. Uh, maybe that means walking in the pro-life march with Roman Catholics. Maybe that means working at the Pregnancy Resource Center with Eastern Orthodox. Maybe that means teaching at seminaries or bringing people to our seminaries that are Baptists or Presbyterian. Recognizing that those differences are, are less important than the difference of having a Christendom for our children and seeing Christendom fall. And I believe that Christ will not permit, permit the church to fail. And so we take that confidence and we say, onward, onward with the RSC, onward with the ACNA. May God purify his church, take it from its errors, which we, we believe they've been there. <laughs> May he heal our bumps and scrapes and bruises and our mistakes and give us an ability to recognize even those in our own backyard, recognizing that building something requires more than just me. Now, all the complaints can be directed to, uh, to myself, not to, <laughs> to my bishop, but uh, um, I, am, I am a Presbyterian in the Diocese of Mid-America, so if there's anything objectionable here, feel free to, to share that with him. I didn't run this by him beforehand, so I, I hope everything I've said here is, is uh, kosher with, with the REC's uh, vision for the future. And I believe it is. I believe that we do have a, a great hope and that things are going to work out and we don't have to compromise. And... Uh, that there's some humility there. So thank you, and uh, I know this is strange for my channel, especially since I'm not wearing my uh, typical <laughs> uh, uh, clerical garb. Uh, it's a Saturday, I'm here writing for tomorrow's uh, service, and so uh, perhaps this will make a fun thumbnail because it'll really look like I left the ACNA because I'm not even wearing my, my priestly garment. But anyway, Lord bless. <laughs>